Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and in this episode of Computer Organization and Design, we're going to move on and start talking about performance. Right, so if we want to you know, create a new architecture, what's really important, you know, other than the architecture itself, is how do we evaluate it compared to other architectures and previous architectures. And to you know, have a motivating example, let's consider uh, comparing four different uh, airplanes, right? So right here we've got you know, a 777, 747, a Concorde, and a DC-8. And if somebody were to ask us, you know, which one is the best, well, there's no really clear answer, right? So if we care about capacity, well, it seems like the 747 is the best. Likewise, if we care about, you know, cruising range, maybe it's the DC-8. If we care about cruise, uh, cruise, or sorry, cruising range, uh, and if we care about cruising speed, maybe the Concorde is the best, right? And likewise with passenger throughput, maybe it's the Boeing 747 again that's the best, right? So. Uh, the key thing here is that there's really no right answer sometimes, and so what, we, what we'd really like to do is to figure out how do we effectively evaluate a new architecture and what should we take, in, uh, take into consideration, right? So, uh, so when we're you know, designing a new architecture, it's important to know what we're designing it for. And there's really two main categories, and that will be whether or not we're optimizing for response time or we're optimizing for throughput or bandwidth. So when we're talking about response time, uh, otherwise known as execution time, uh, this is just the total time required for the computer to complete a task, including disk access, memory ask, access, I.O., operating system overhead, CPU execution, and so on. Right, so, so how do we put this in more, more human terms? Right, so you can consider, say, opening an app on your phone. Right, so this is a response time dominated activity, right? So you don't want somebody to be holding their phone, press an app, and it takes, you know, forever to open an app, right? So here we really care about response time. But now take something else in consideration. Take a giant, you know, application that's running on some giant cluster or server, uh, or, you know, cluster of servers, rather. Um, this is something that we probably care more about bandwidth. So each of the individual tasks we're launching, we might not care exactly what the response time is. What we care about more is the bandwidth, uh, which is another measure of performance, and it's the number of tasks completed per unit time. So what we're caring about uh, with throughput is just completing more work, not necessarily com completing a part of the work as fast as we can. So it's important. So why is this so important? Well, we don't want to, you know, say going back up to the airplane up here. You know, if if all we care about is how far we can go, well, we probably don't want to compare uh, the Douglas. Uh, we don't want to compare uh, the Douglas DC-8 against you know, any of these other planes, just because they're not designed for that. Likewise, we wouldn't uh, compare, uh, you know, the 747, which has this nice balance of capacity and throughput. We probably don't want to compare it, you know, against the Concorde, um, which is optimized more for speed, right? So it's important to know what we're trying to design in terms of how we compare this and what metrics do we use to compare these architectures. So now let's get a little bit more into the metrics themselves. So the obvious one is performance, which is uh, just going to be one over the execution time, right, for a particular computer X. So how do we make sense of this? Well, if the execution time goes up, that means it takes longer to execute. Uh, this number right here will end up getting smaller, meaning that our performance ends up getting worse, right? So our performance goes down. Likewise, if the execution time goes down, this entire uh, right-hand side will go up, meaning our performance goes up. So basically, if it takes longer to execute, our performance goes down. If it takes a shorter time to execute, our performance goes up, right? So we can we can change this into an inequality right here. So we can say, you know, what if we want to say the performance of X is greater than the performance of Y? This is the same thing as saying the uh, one over the execution time of X is greater than one over the execution time of Y, or the execution time of Y is greater than the execution time of X. Uh, usually, though, when we're comparing two things, we'll often just leave it as a ratio, right? And we'll get a, a unitless number out. So if we want to say that X is n times uh, fast, uh, n times faster than Y, we'll just put the performance of X over the performance of Y, and this will give us some number n. So as a quick example, if we say that A runs a program in 10 seconds and B runs the same program in 15 seconds, you know, how many times faster is A than B? So you know, working this out, it's a rather tri trivial example, but maybe it's useful to go through. So we just said the performance of A over the performance of B will give us that ratio, right? And this gives us the execution time of B over the execution time of A. And this is because 
uh, performance is equal to 1 over the execution time of A over 1 over the execution time of B, right? So you rearrange uh, this fraction to get execution time of B over the execution time of A. Now in this case, it's rather simple. It's 15 seconds over 10 seconds or 1.5. So here we'd say that A is 1.5 times um, faster than B or uh, B is 1.5 times slower than A. Right. So uh, when it comes to measuring performance, you know, what does time actually mean? So we have a lot of different ways of measuring time, and you know, some it's it's important that we understand the way different clocks work. So one clock we have is CPU execution time. Now CPU, uh, also called CPU time, this is the actual time the CPU spends uh, computing for uh, a specific task, uh, and this differs from system CPU time which is the time spent in the operating system performing uh, tasks on behalf of the program. So when we're, when we're comparing these two things and we're comparing something like, uh, you know, wall clock time, response time, or elapsed time, uh, the, these things right here, right, so wall clock time, this will include everything that we're doing in a program. So this will be, you know, actually computing on, say, data, accessing a disk, memory accesses, you know, waiting for I.O., and operating system overhead but you know a lot of times we want to you know kind of take that away and just see how fast uh, the program is actually executing so there may be times where something will get descheduled right if we have a multi-core or even if we have a single core right it will will we'll kind of switch between different processes at any point so we may not want the timer to continue when our particular program isn't doing anything right so when we have something like cpu execution time we're cutting out all that dead space where maybe we're not actually doing anything or progressing forward in our program. We're just waiting. So we'll cut all of that out. So a lot of times we'll just use CPU execution time instead of something like a uh, wall clock time. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a also important to know that, you know, we, we break these things down even further. So we don't just go by time in terms of seconds. A lot of times we break this down even further. So um, it's often convenient uh, to think about these things in terms of how, fa how fast we can do the basic functions inside of our hardware, right? So how fast can we move an instruction down the pipeline? And this is often determined by these discrete time intervals that we call clock cycles. And these things have lots of different uh, names. So some people call them a clock cycle, a tick, a clock tick, clock period, clock or a cycle, right? Lots of names for the same thing, but this is the fundamental you know, unit of you know progressing things in hardware and how long these units are is the clock period right so you may be familiar with you know a frequency on a processor say four gigahertz or something or two gigahertz uh, this is just saying how many clocks uh, how many clock ticks or cycles can you get uh, per second uh, for this processor right so um you know we want to relate different metrics though Right, so if, if we're able to relate different metrics together, you know, we've got a better idea of you know the different uh, the different aspects of computing or the different aspects of performance that will affect overall execution time. So if we want to break down the execution time of a program, we can do that first by talking about how many cycles are in the program and then the clock cycle time. Right, so if we want to decompose this. Uh, the execution time of a program is just going to be the number of cycles times the clock cycle time. Uh, an example of why we maybe want to decompose this into you know, this granularity, we can think of a little design example where we've got a program that runs in 10 seconds on computer A, and maybe you know, we're pretty clever and we've got the ability to increase the frequency some arbitrary amount, with the downside is it will cause 1.2 times as many clock cycles. Right, so we've got more cycles to do, but we can do those cycles faster. Now, how fast do we need to make the clock uh, in order to run the program in six seconds? Now, as a little example, uh, the first thing we need to do is figure out, you know, how many cycles are we actually going through? Which is, you know, just by this ratio, CPU time of A is equal to the number of cycles over the clock rate. Right, so we can figure out that, you know, our CPU time is going to be 10 seconds. Uh, the number of cycles, we don't know, that's what we're looking for, but we know the frequency, which is 2 gigahertz, or 2 times 10 to the ninth, 2 times 10 to the ninth cycles per second, right? So we can just multiply across, and we end up getting that the number of cycles is going to be 
20 times 10 to the 9 cycles. So if we were to try and figure out, you know, okay, well, we know it's going to be 1.2 times as many cycles as A for B. How fast do I need to uh, speed up the clock in order to get this to 6 seconds? Well, it's the exact same formula, other than we scale the number of cycles by 1.2, which is 20%. And then we also uh, plug in for CPU time B, six seconds. So this is our target goal. So now what we're solving for is this clock rate, right? And this is a fairly simple, um, fairly simple problem. We'll just multiply over by clock rate, divide by six seconds as we do here, right? So what we first do is we divide by six seconds and 1.2. So this turns to 0.2. Then we multiply 0.2 and 20. This gives us four times 10 to the nine. And then uh, this is going to be our answer. So in order to get our you know, program to run in six seconds uh, with a small penalty of being 1.2 times as many clock cycles or 20% more clock cycles, uh, I need the processor B to run at four gigahertz, right? So now we have enough, now instead of just having you know, a flat number of you know, execution time, now I've, we, we can break this down into, well, how much do I need to speed up a cl the clock by in our system? And we can further break this down, right? So fundamentally what a CPU is doing is executing instructions. So we can break down, uh, or oftentimes the, what we look at uh, is in turn, uh, as far as performance goes, is how fast is our processor actually executing instructions. So one way to think about execution time is that it equals the number of instructions executed multiplied by the average time per instruction, right? So we'll take the overall execution time and we'll evenly split it across all instructions. Right, so we get uh, the number of CPU clock cycles is equal to the instructions for a program times the average clock cycle per instruction. Right, so we often use this metric called CPI or clock cycles per instruction, which is this average number that we're talking about. So let's consider a simple example of why it's important to look at something like CPI and how, you know, it can be you know misleading necessarily you know different clock rates. Uh, so let's let's take a simple example where we've got computer A that has a clock cycle time of 250 picoseconds, which is pretty fast, and then a CPI of two, and then we have B which has a uh, a clock cycle time of 500 picoseconds, so a bit slower, um, but its CPI or the number of clock cycles per instruction is actually a lot less, right? So. Uh, B only takes 1.2 clock cycles to do an instruction on average, while A takes um, two cycles, right? But it has a much faster clock. So if we want to figure out, you know, which computer is faster for this program and by how much, well, the first thing we'll need to do, right, is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just give an, have an arbitrary number I, right? And that'll be the number of instructions in the program. Uh, and this really doesn't matter because it's just going to be constant for both because they're running the same program. So we'll just leave it as a variable I. So, if, you know, first what we do is we find the number of processor clock cycles for each computer, right? So the number of clock cycles is just going to be um, the number of instructions in the program times the average uh, uh, clock cycles per instruction or CPI. So for A, it'll be I times two, for B, it'll be I times 1.2. Right, so the next uh, the next thing we need to do is figure out the CPU time. Right, so how how long is this going to take? Right, so in order to do this, uh, we just multiply by uh, how long each cycle is. So for A, it'll be I times two, so the number of instructions times the cycles per instruction times how long the cycles are. Right, so for computer A, it'll be 500 times I picoseconds, and then for computer B, it'll be you know, I times 1.2 times 500 picoseconds, which is 600. So what we see here is that even though, you know, the cycles per instruction is, is quite a lot less, right? So, you know, 1.2 versus two cycles per instruction, because the, uh, because how long the clock cycle is, right? Because it's 500 seconds versus 250 picoseconds, uh, computer A ends up being faster, right? And then you can just do the ratio of these two times to figure out that A is 1.2 times fast, uh, faster than B for the program, right? So now we've, you know, we've kind of seen that, you know, we've got to be careful in terms of just trying to go by one metric. And this, this will get further, this problem further gets exacerbated by looking at, you know, we also need to consider uh, which instructions we're executing.
right? So, so now we'll write the basic performance equation in terms of instruction count, um, CPI and clock cycle time, right? So we'll, we'll consider CPU time being the instruction count times the CPI times the clock cycle time, right? Which is what we basically did up here. That's this, uh, this calculation, this I times two times 250 picoseconds uh, in this case. All right. Uh, or since uh, the clock rate is the inverse of the clock time, you can do CPU time is equal to instruction count times CPI over clock rate. All right. So, uh, so why are these why are these formulas useful? So we've gone over quite a few formulas, and it's because it allows us to separate the key factors um, that affect performance, right? Uh, so we can use these formulas to compare two different implementations or to evaluate a design alternative if we know it, its impact on these three parameters. So let's take another example, right? So we've got someone that's designing a compiler that we've talked about what a compiler actually does. It's trying to decide between two code sequences for a computer, right? So the hardware designers have supplied the following facts, right? So we have a list of CPIs. So we've got three different classes of instructions. One of them takes one cycle to execute or the clock cycle per instruction for class A is one for class B is two and class three, uh, class C is three, right? And then we have a code sequence and this is just the number of instructions in each of these categories, right? So uh, the questions we wanna answer is which code uh, executes the most instructions, which will be faster and what is the CPI for each? Now, you know, how many instructions get executed is a rather trivial example. We just add these together. So two plus one plus two is five and four plus one plus one is six. Right, so if we were to just go by the number of instructions, it seems like sequence one is better because it executes fewer instructions. All right, so now let's move on to CPI. Right, so if we wanna do CPI, we have to take into consideration up here the CPI for each class of instruction. So uh, in order to do that, we'll just do this, um, this summation, right? So first we need to figure out how many cycles overall are executed here. So we know that um, for the first uh, for code sequence one, it'll do two instructions from A, which take one cycle, one instruction from B that takes two cycles, and two instructions from C, which take three cycles, right? So this works out to two times one, plus one times two, plus two times three, or 10 cycles total. While uh, for two, right, that executes six instructions, but four from A this time, one from B and only one from C, this ends up being four times one, plus one times two, plus one times three, which ends up being nine cycles. So even though it's more instructions, it ends up executing faster, right? Uh, given an equivalent uh, clock frequency. So if we were to figure out the CPI for each of these, right? So uh, code sequence one executes 10 instructions, uh, or rather uh, in 10 cycles, it executes five instructions. So this ends up getting giving us a CPI of two, while the CPI of processor two uh, it gives us uh, nine cycles to execute six instructions or a CPI of 1.5. So what is the big takeaway here? And it's clearly that, um, you know, we've got this, uh, we've got this nice formula here in order to, you know, calculate the time for a program. They can be broken down into different sections being the instructions per program, clock cycles per instruction and seconds per clock cycle. Right. So, uh, you know, how can we determine the values of these factors in a performance equation? Well, you know, there's a number of things we can do. So we can measure CPU execution time by running the program and clock cycle time is something that's normally published, right? So when you buy a processor, it'll say, you know, runs at 3.7 gigahertz, right? Uh, but things like the instruction count and CPI can be a little more difficult. Um, there's often profiling tools that will give you some indication of your CPI um, or Rather, a lot of times we use IPC. And the reason why we use IPC is because uh, in CPI, clock cycles per instruction, lower is better, right? And that's non-intuitive uh, sometimes to look at. So a lot of times we use the inverse of CPI, which is something called IPC, which is instructions per clock cycle, right? And that's because it's very naturally easy to understand as far as a, you know, a larger number being better. All right, so, you know, one thing though that it's important to keep in mind during all of this is that you know with that above example it shows the danger of only using one factor say instruction count to assess performance 
and a lot of older you know, metrics for evaluating performance, such as MIPS, uh, not the MIPS instruction set, but MIPS in terms of millions of instructions per second, you know, they can be very misleading because what kinds of instructions are you actually executing? So if we go back to the simple example, if I do a million, of, uh, you know, a million instructions in a second or, you know, in million instructions per second, but all I'm executing is instructions from class A, right? Okay, that's that's not exactly, you know, these, these instructions execute very fast, but if a different class of instruction, you know, executes the, you know, the same amount of instructions, but from class C, right? So we've got, you know, two different weights of instructions here, right? So uh, it's important that we understand, you know, the breakdown of which instructions are actually getting executed as we sh as we kind of showed here with these two different sequences of instructions that lead you to two different IPCs. Right, so it, it's important that we look at all three components and that we combine to form execution time. So at the very end of the day, what we really care about is execution time. So when we're comparing performance, uh, even though we may do worse in some areas, you know, if it runs faster overall, a lot of times, uh, that's acceptable. Uh, and it all it all depends on what faster overall means. So we're talking about throughput or we're talking about response time. Right. So another thing that we'll kind of close out on is this understanding program performance and the different parts uh, that ex the different parts of, uh, um, you know, computer architecture and computer organization that affect performance. So, you know, something like the algorithm that we implement, this will uh, this will influence, you know, the instruction count. You know, clearly if you have a very complex algorithm, it'll probably have a lot of instructions versus a very simple algorithm. And it will also affect the CPI, right? So what are we actually doing in the algorithm? So, you know, how many loads are we doing? How many stores are we doing? Uh, these are things that are all, you know, generally algorithm dependent, right? The programming language itself will affect the instruction count uh, and the CPI, depending on, you know, the level of abstraction that we use. The compiler, of course, which is actually going to take our high level language and generate a low level language. This will, of course, affect our uh, instruction count and CPI. And then the actual instruction set architecture. So now we're actually getting, you know, into the hardware side of things. This will, of course, affect the instruction count, uh, the clock rate. So now we're getting into more physical things. And of course, the CPI, right? So, you know, Although you might expect that the minimum CPI is uh, is one, we'll see that you know some processors fetch and execute multiple instructions per clock cycle, so you know you can even have you know a faster CPI than one or or you know a lower CPI than one. So you, you know if you did two instructions per clock cycle because you were able to issue two in the same cycle, you could you know theoretically get a CPI of 0 0.5. All right, but that's going to go ahead and do it for this episode. So let's kind of wrap things up as what we covered. So, you know, again, time is really, you know, what our, what our base, base truth is in terms of performance, right? So something, you know, we've got all of these different, you know, metrics that we can collect, but at the end of the day, what we care about is, is our execution time better? We also talked about, you know, which metrics are we optimizing for in terms of comparison? So are you optimizing more for throughput or optimizing more for uh, response time? And we went through a couple examples, you know, showing, you know, the basis of, you know, calculating things with CPI, performance calculations, and talking about how instruction mix uh, is an important thing to consider. And we can't just consider the number of instructions that we execute. But that's going to do it for this episode. Next time, we'll go ahead and talk about the power wall. And we'll talk about, you know, kind of the end of transistor scaling. Uh, feel free to check out any of my other courses uh, or video series on github.com slash coffee before arch. We've got all kinds of neat stuff on here, all right? So we've got C++, GPU programming with CUDA, parallel programming in C++. This is at github.com slash coffee But I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.